Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen to a new edition of the Daily Debate. In tonight's show we're going to be focusing on the health file. This is in light of 46 medical convoys that will be uh, taking over from Cairo to a lot of the border governorates, a lot of the underprivileged uh, villages and countrysides all over Egypt starting from December 2nd until December 10th. We're going to be focusing on the Decent Life Initiative and the health file within this initiative and we're joined here in the studio tonight by Dr. Islam Anen, the lecturer of the Health Policy and Health Economics at Ain Shams University. Dr. Anen, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me and Hello, Mr. Hadi. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start our conversation and discussion with Dr. Ane, let's check out this report regarding the 46 medical, free medical convoys uh, from December 2nd to the 10th, going to different underprivileged villages and border governorates. Let's check out this report and we'll be right back. The Ministry of Health launches 46 free medical convoys in the governorates from today until December 10th. Ministry of Health and Population announced the launch of 46 free medical convoys in governorates of the Republic starting from the 2nd until the 10th of December as part of the presidential initiative Decent Life. The medical convoys are directed to the border governorates and remote villages with a commitment to take all precautionary measures to prevent the spread of coronavirus. The convoys include all medical specialities including internal medicine, children, nose and ear bones, surgery, teeth, heart, dermatology and childbirth, family planning services in addition to radiology and medical analysis services, in addition to a pharmacy that is available in all medicines and cases that need surgical operations are transferred to hospitals affiliated with the ministry. Three medical convoys will be launched on the 2nd and 3rd of December in Arbaya Governorate, Abu Ghalib in Manshayt al Qanatir neighborhood in Giza Governorate, and the Triangles Medical Center in Hadaik Halwen in Al Masra district in Cairo Governorate. Seven medical convoys will be launched on December 3rd and 4th in the critical areas in Suhag Governorate, Kafr Sheikh Governorate, Kaliubeya Governorate, Asyut and Fayyum Governorates. Egypt is set to start second stage of Decent Life Initiative, which comprises series of countryside focused national infrastructure projects by January 2023. Minister of Local Development Hisham Amna said the second stage of the presidential scheme is planned to cover 1,670 villages countrywide to provide services for some 20 million citizens. The Decent Life National Project was initiated experimentally in 2019 by President Afatah Sisi and its first phase was officially launched in July 2021. The initiative aims to improve standard of living infrastructure and basic services including healthcare across the countryside covering 4658 villages across the country which are home to 58% of Egypt's 103 million population. The enormous volume of work needed to develop the selected villages required initiative to be divided into three stages with a total estimated budget of 700 billion Egyptian pounds. The first stage of the initiative that services 28 million citizens in 1,477 villages is expected to be concluded by December. Initially planned to be completed by 30th of June 2022, the program was delayed by shortage of raw materials and equipment from abroad owing to the current global circumstances. Some 23,000 projects have started within the scheme's first stage with implementation rate hitting over 70 percent. The initiative as a great and unique program does not exist in any other country as it aims to achieve social justice among all Egyptian people. The investments in the presidential program are expected to reach more than one trillion Egyptian pounds. The three-stage initiative will change the shape of Egyptian countryside, improve the lives of citizens and make all basic services available.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, starting off our discussion with uh, Dr. Anen. Now, Dr. We are talking about the 46 free medical convoys, and this is part of the Decent Life Initiative. Now, the, the whole initiative was actually was launched and started mm -hmm. being implemented in July 2021. Now we're ending the, the yeah. first phase, phase of it, yeah. and the second phase will be, looking, uh, will be starting on, in January 2023. Now, let's say that this 40, these 46 convoys are considered uh, some sort of a conclusion mm -hmm. for the first phase. Before we start talking about the actual convoys, how would you assess the, the, the health file within the Decent Life Initiative that, that is really uh, looking at a thousand, almost a thousand villages so far in the first phase? Yeah, so that's a good point to start with, which is uh, our vision and focus for health. Mm -hmm. So if we are looking on the file of healthcare since 2018, Mm -hmm. We can see you know, a drift and change, a big change in terms of even financials. So we were talking about a budget uh, allocated for healthcare from the Ministry of Finance mm -hmm. of around 70 billion Egyptian pounds. But we are talking since 2018 till now around an average of 200 billion Egyptian pounds. So mm -hmm. there is a leap in the financial resources and for as well the vision itself. So since 2018 and the launch of the presidential initiatives, we focused more on what's called a person-centric vision of mm -hmm. healthcare. So uh, countries all over the world, they focus on one of three centricities, either a system-centric healthcare, which is just focusing on having a good data, a good system, a good governance, and a good digitization and digitalization, mm -hmm. or it's a patient-centric, where we are looking at the benchmark of diseases and whether we are above or below the benchmark, mm -hmm. or a person-centric, which is a public health concern, mm -hmm. focusing that we don't need any patients. Mm -hmm. So it's either patient-centric and I'm treating the patients, or it's better, it's a person-centric and I don't want any person to be a patient. Mm -hmm. So uh, because of the vision, uh, we started in Egypt and the presidential initiative were focusing on having a better life for Egyptian citizens. And that's why we've seen screening programs, we've seen early detection for diseases, we've seen 100 Healthy Lives initiative, mm -hmm. and we've seen a Decent Life initiative, which is focusing mainly on the health as a product, so mm -hmm. improving health. So and it's a person-centric? It is a person-centric. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, we are working on enhancing, of course, the system, mm -hmm. so we can finish the system centricity and the patient centricity while aiming for the goal of person centricity at 2030 inshallah mm -hmm. so basically for decent life initiative it's how to reach as you mentioned in the introduction how to reach the underprivileged citizen who can actually find the logistics of seeking the insurance and healthcare a bit complicated maybe they are not aware of the paperwork and logistics mm -hmm. uh, maybe they are not aware of whether they got symptoms or not, whether they need to seek any medical consultation. So it's better to reach them door by door mm -hmm. and tell them, okay, I'm at your uh, doorstep, just tell me if you need any help, any support, and then I can make the differential diagnosis. And the convoys are actually equipped from the beginning of the journey, which is diagnosis, having lab and diagnostic tests and diagnostic tools till diagnosis, differential mm -hmm. diagnosis, whether the patient got any uh, non-communicable disease or a communicable disease. And then if needed, there is a tertiary care. For example, they need a nephrologist, they need someone who can track their diabetes profile. And if there is, for example, something which is need a complex intervention or a complex imaging, they mm -hmm. can be sent to the insurance coverage entity they belong to. Because, you know, Egyptians are actually with the HIO, Health Insurance Organization Insurance, or mm -hmm. they are with the uh, on-state fund insurance. Mm -hmm. So that's the convoys. It uh, provides what is called a health integrated services mm -hmm. from the diagnosis part till the follow-up and treatment management. Mm -hmm. So these 46 free medical convoys, they're basically maybe part of the patient-centric system and they're actually dealing with the patients uh, starting from as you've mentioned the diagnosis to the treatment and the following up of the treatment now the first phase um, really targets about almost 25 million Egyptian yes. citizens yeah. now 
how far and how uh, aware are those 25 million that have been uh, subjected to the implementation of the first phase of the Decent Life Initiative with its health care. How aware are they of going to the doctor, doing regular checkups, uh, trying to deal with any sort of symptoms or no. suspicions of uh, a, a disease or illness before it actually deteriorates? That's actually another good point because mm -hmm. uh, health education, it's a hot topic. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, even during COVID, with, or you've seen, for example, you do a lot of access programs where you actually put the treatment, vaccines, and everything inside the health uh, care service providing uh, facilities. Mm -hmm. But you end up with uh, limited flow from the patients, what we called the reach. Mm -hmm. So in terms of having a good access and a good reach, you need a very good health education and health awareness. Sometimes people are not aware that these symptoms are a hospital driver symptom. Mm -hmm. You need a medical consultation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they are not aware that's a communicable disease. Maybe you can infect someone else. You need to isolate yourself. So uh, these two both things, whether the health education and awareness are two different things. We begin with the awareness first and then mm -hmm. education. And it's actually basically built in as well in the convoys because you are spreading awareness through brochures, through uh, consultation with the physician, how to deal with your daily routine. It's pure patient-centric, but we are trying as well if the patient is free of disease, mm -hmm. that how can you improve your health? For example, uh, you do have with the convoy itself the same initiative of the dwarfism, stunting, and obesity, mm -hmm. which is going to be targeting the uh, children mm -hmm. as well as adults. So you are focusing on trying to improve the quality of life and the lifestyle. Yes. And this is a very important point because mm -hmm we are facing a high prevalence of diabetes in Egypt. By 2050, it will be one of the top five countries with the number of diabetic patients. Mm -hmm. So we need to decrease as much possible obesity, for example, at children uh, level. And we need as well to manage the lifestyle and the eating habits. That's why you will find that all the presidential initiatives are connected together. So you got a decent life. It's connected with the stunting and obesity initiative. It's as well uh, associated with the lifestyle modification initiative mm -hmm. so you are trying to build on the health of the citizens and trying to diagnose but same time early detect and trying to prevent mm -hmm. the upcoming diseases yes yeah. about the 46 medical convoys now it is the winter season here in Egypt yeah. now is there a significant uh, a significance for the timing of these convoys uh, where they uh, were they supposed to be sent out earlier? Could they be regularly sent uh, a certain number of convoys for every changing of the season, for instance? Mm -hmm. What is the significance and the main goal and uh, the main um, achievement that these 46 convoys want to achieve? So basically because of we are uh, approaching the flu and RSV mm -hmm. season we have a surge right now in many countries around the world from RSV perspective mm -hmm. uh, it's important to have your convoys at uh, periodic quarters per year so you got at the beginning of uh, the season you are beginning of the spring season so you are actually spreading through the year if you are entering the winter season, it's very important to have the convoys covering as well as the communicable diseases. Mm -hmm. So for example, if there's any patient approaching the convoy with any symptoms of a communicable disease, talking about flu, common cold, COVID or RSV, mm -hmm. they can be actually handled very easily because they are not only handling chronic diseases or uh, diagnosing chronic diseases, they will be handling as well acute or infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, it's, it's good that you mentioned the winter. The RSV virus is spreading. Mm -hmm. we, have a, we have it circulating uh, all over the government lines, all over the world, actually. Mm -hmm. And it, it's good that uh, we are focusing now on the preventive measures mm -hmm. for the RSV. It's a respiratory virus. Um, it's exactly the same preventive measures of COVID. We got acquainted now yes. with the preventive measures mm -hmm. of COVID. So it's the same story. But we need to as well educate parents how to manage their children mm -hmm. because in winter season and all respiratory diseases early management and good management at early stage is the key for successful remedy and successful remission mm -hmm. it can be actually uh, went out in one week mm -hmm. but if it's for example with a bad treatment and there is no follow-up 
in the first week, it can last for three weeks or four weeks. Mm -hmm. Dr. Anan, now, the first phase of the Decent Life Initiative was in July 2019. Now, that's almost three years now. Yeah. And in those three years, the whole world went through a, a coronavirus pandemic, and then we heard of the monkeypox, yeah. and then cholera, and the, the seasonal flu, and the, and the respiratory diseases. Now, in terms of trying to implement such an initiative with an, a main concern with the health aspect mm -hmm. of this initiative, did these pandemics, these diseases, did, did they hinder or slow down the implementation, the health implementation within the Decent Life Initiative, or did we learn something about ourselves? Did we learn more about our health? Uh, system, the um, mm -hmm. system-centric at least, yeah. uh, qualities and characteristics of our initiative? So, um, talking about, for example, 2020 mm -hmm. and the beginning of COVID, we've learned that uh, the main key of having an efficient healthcare system is agility. Mm -hmm. We don't have an agile healthcare system. Mm -hmm. We've uh, seen systems with um, rigid and robust structure on the shell outside, mm -hmm. but deep inside they are suffering a lot from long logistics, which is countries were ranked at the top five countries in the healthcare, something like Italy, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, however, we've, we've learned a lot that being agile in terms of taking fast decisions, being agile in changing our health policies from, how, uh, from partial lockdown to, for example, designated hospitals for isolation, uh, for example, moving physicians from a governor rate to another. Mm -hmm. This agile system and the fast decisions managed that we can actually go through the wave very easily. And another thing we've learned, how can we manage chronic diseases through the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Because um, at 2020, we had the initiatives for chronic diseases and we needed that these patients continue taking their treatments. Mm -hmm. Sustainability of treatment is the key for preventing complications. And the complications is the number one cause of deaths in the chronic diseases. So, for example, they've done the safety passage. The safety passage is actually uh, a plan that you can move patients inside hospitals to take their treatments outside of the isolation hospitals. Mm -hmm. uh, they can uh, seek their medical consultation. And instead of taking one month's uh, medication, they can take six months so they, they don't need to travel a lot to their hospital or their dispensing pharmacies. Mm -hmm. Another point which was actually very important it, is to say designate specific hospital for isolation and COVID mm -hmm. and another hospitals only for senior citizens and geriatrics. Mm -hmm. So you are making sure that people above 65, they are not contacting or approaching any COVID cases or any hospital with COVID cases. Mm -hmm. So we managed, maybe it slowed down a little bit the initiatives, yes. of course, and uh, for example, the 100 healthy lives, but in terms of targets, we managed to achieve the targets. So if we're looking at figures, because figures will be a good judge here, mm -hmm. uh, we managed to finish the hepatitis C initiative earlier. Mm -hmm. We managed to treat more than 2 million patients. We managed to screen 25 million women mm -hmm. uh, for the breast cancer initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, for the children uh, hearing aid and health, they've managed to screen 3 million children. Every year, even through the pandemic, the stunting and obesity and anemic uh, children presidential initiative, they managed to screen around from 8 to 9 millions every year. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was 10 at uh, 2019, but at 2020 it was eight. So there's two million difference. Yes. Then because you know the lockdown, there's no many children going to school. Yes. It was nine in 2021, and then in return now the target will be 10 millions again. So maybe there is a slowdown a little bit, but we managed at least to keep the targets of the presidential nation. Mm -hmm. Dr. Anen, now. We are, we are kind of done with the first phase of the Decent Life Initiative. The second phase will start mm -hmm. in January, which is next month. Now, what are the main targets? I mean, the Decent Life Initiative is a big one that includes different mm -hmm. uh, sectors within uh, the government. But with a focus on the health sector, now, is it just about targeting more villages and more people and m millions more uh, yeah. Egyptian citizens, or are we 
trying to develop the the system centric and the, the patient centric and the person centric mm -hmm. are we done with certain centrics and then trying to achieve different centrics or is it just more yeah. of the same that what we've done and achieved so far in the first phase of the decent life initiative okay so we are moving in many directions mm -hmm. so for example we have the system patient and person centric uh, Egypt is trying to move in the three centricities together, but the aim is patient-centric. Mm -hmm. The main purpose of the convoys is to reach what's called equity in healthcare. So y y you need to ensure that all citizens, all Egyptians, are actually getting the same uh, healthcare mm -hmm. at any government rate, at any village, uh, regardless they are actually in remote or rural areas or in urban or main cities. Mm -hmm. So that's the main purpose, to reach them all. And second one is to have a good database of the Egyptians because you are not going to be able to sustain a good health care without data, mm -hmm. uh, without an informed decision making process. And we need to build a good data about the Egyptian uh, people's health, mm -hmm. the diseases, for example, the epidemiology of chronic diseases, the prevalence, uh, the incidence, the mortality rate, the remission. So we are actually treating patients with fairness and achieving equity, which is, as per the vision, we do have two main pillars in the vision, the mm -hmm. equity and the efficiency. And the efficiency will come next after we are having the data. Yes. So these are the two main pillars we mm -hmm. are trying to seek, treating all Egyptians by fairness and equity and equitable access and reach. And mm -hmm. secondly, to have efficiency, which is a data-driven thing that mm -hmm. after uh, we collect database, we can actually make another initiatives, enroll them in actually insurance system because you will have the government rates being enrolled in the new insurance, universal health insurance system, mm -hmm. govern rate after govern rate. So yes. you need this database and at least to make the capacity building and the planning of your resources, especially if you are going to the high density population mm -hmm. govern rates in the near future next year. Yes. Well, now that you've mentioned the, the, the health insurance system, now, the Decent Life Initiative targets the villages, uh, more than 4,000 villages across yeah. the whole of Egypt, but the health insurance system covers all of Egypt, including the uh, highly densely uh, and sort of developed govern rates. Now, where, I mean, do, the, do they both have some sort of a common ground? Do they intersect in one way, or are they two different plans uh, trying to cover or with two different systems, mm. with uh, the, uh, I mean, the Decent Life Initiative has the, th the three centrics, and at the same time, the health insurance system maybe doesn't focus mainly on one, the system yeah. centric, for instance, because it deals with a lot of developed uh, mm. yeah. uh, hospitals and maybe more dealing with the private sector within the health, uh, within, um, the health sector. So uh, let's start with the end here. Mm -hmm. So by 2031, we should have universal health insurance organization, which is covering all Egyptians. And we do have an Egyptian health authority, which is treating all Egyptians. We have two entities. Yes. And that's actually coming from the health governance of separating entities to remove any conflict and increasing uh, efficient governance. Mm -hmm. So um, year after year, you are trying to migrate from the old system to the new system. And we are trying as well to integrate between the database of the old system and the database of the new system. Mm -hmm. So each government rate, the Egyptian Health Authority and the Universal Health Insurance Organization entered, they actually override the systems of the old one. They took the database, they started to treat all patients and all the old insurance will drop down and they will opt out from it. So mm -hmm. all, for example, people from port side, they are now covered only by the universal health insurance. The new and system. Not, yes, and mm -hmm. not the old system. So uh, even the presidential initiative database, the health insurance organization, the old one, the own state fund, the old one, all of these are actually canceled in the govern rates that actually have the universal health coverage. Mm -hmm. And then in the other govern rates, you are trying to make what's called a capacity building and a reform plan to integrate the database and the system to the new one. Mm -hmm. So basically, all of us will be insured under universal health insurance. It's a household based, so it will be deducted from the salaries. 
and then you do you are paying premiums exactly like the private health insurance mm -hmm. but you are taking it in both private or governmental it would be as a selection from the citizen choice he can mm -hmm. go to a private hospital or go to a governmental hospital and they should have the same pricing uh, index so if you need an extra service maybe there will be a complementary services mm -hmm. from another source but at least we are targeting 80% of Egyptians by 2030 to have this insurance. It's very important because uh, we used to have around 60% out-of-pocket healthcare financing in Egypt. Mm -hmm. yes. So 60% uh, of the healthcare expenditure is coming from the citizens' pocket. And we need to, to flip it, we need to make it the reverse. Mm -hmm. So that's why the aim is to have it all from the government perspective and decrease as much possible out-of-pocket because when you decrease the out-of-pocket, you are taking more control in generating health mm -hmm. because you are not leaving it to the private market, to the commercialized market. And it's a faster access if any patient would like to seek emergency, for example, mm -hmm. to seek uh, uh, a surgery, a tertiary care, easier than paying. Sometimes people are paying all their savings yes. for a surgery. Mm -hmm. So that's the main aim again. We'll end up with the same two pillars, equity, all Egyptians are treated the same in healthcare, mm -hmm. and efficiency in terms of actually spending and in terms of savings. And how long would that sort of transition from the old system to the new health system, uh, how long would this transition period take to be all uh, the new system substituting the old system, especially that if 60% of mm -hmm. the financing comes from the citizens' money, yeah there could be some resistance from the private sector who make the yeah. biggest profit and benefit the most from yeah. these 60 percent so how can you overcome the any sort of resistance from the private sector and at mm. the same time make it as speedy uh, and as quick as possible this sort of transitional period that's a, a very simple question in saying mm -hmm. it's very complex in terms of answering but mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of time plan and timetable, um, Egypt has put a timetable to finish the transition and migration by 2031. Mm -hmm. So by 2031, the full migration will end by Cairo. It will be the last <laughs> government raid mm -hmm. to enter the health insurance, uh, insurance uh, system. In terms of resistance, yes, that's correct. You are talking about billions of billions mm -hmm. of industry working in private sector yes so uh, the first key thing that the government made is to make a new entity which is called a gahar it's mainly for accreditation and quality management this entity is reporting directly to the presidential office and the role of it is to enroll entities underneath the egyptian health authority and universal coverage mm -hmm. so any private entity that mm -hmm. would like to be part of the private insurance they can do that. They need just to file their requirements and their data to the mm -hmm. Gahar, and Gahar will accredit and say, okay, you are up to the standard, you will be underneath the insurance, mm -hmm. and patients can still go to the private sector. It's very hard to implement any health insurance without private sector. Mm -hmm. You need what's called a public-private partnership. However, you need to make it uh, regulated, you need to have uh, standardized quality for the private sector, mm -hmm. and you need to regulate what's called a commercial uh, medicine, the sporadic clinics. Mm -hmm. So um, any clinic or any private uh, entity will, will not gonna be uh, able to work or operate mm -hmm. in the new system after five or six years if they are operating alone. That's yes. why you will find a lot of uh, lobbying together, a lot mm -hmm. of groups are formed, a lot of group hospitals are formed because they are seeking accreditation and going under the insurance. Yeah. So you need to work with the private sector mm -hmm. to uh, decrease uh, actually the resistance mm -hmm. and you need to uh, regulate their quality. Yes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, actually the Ministry of Planning has issued a report regarding the impact of the Decent Life Initiative, especially that it has concluded the first phase and now entering the second phase. Let's check out this report and we'll be right back. The Ministry of Planning and Economic Development issued a midterm report to monitor and evaluate the impact of Decent Life Presidential Initiative. 
Decent Life is an initiative launched by President Fatah Sisi in 2019 to improve the standard of living and quality of life for the most vulnerable groups in Egypt. Minister of Planning and Economic Development Halal Said affirmed the Egyptian state works to reduce development gaps between governorates by focusing on developing villages most in need. She noted that real development occurs at the governorate level and not in a centralized manner and that each governorate has a different competitive advantage and has different resources. She stressed that justice is one of the goals of the state plan. The Minister of Planning and Economic Development referred to the Quality of Life Index, which is a composite index that aims to create a quantitative tool that helps measure the impact of the efforts undertaken by the state in the field of developing rural communities within the framework of Decent Life Initiative and its implications for the state of sustainable development. Al Said explained that this is done by comparing performance indicators before and after those efforts. She stressed that among the strategic results of the initiative is the villages of the first stage, the quality of life index improved by about 18 percent points and the average poverty rate decreased by about 14 points. The first phase of the Decent Life Initiative, which started in July 2019 until the end of 2020, included 143 villages in 46 centers, 11 government rates, and the number of beneficiaries reached 1.8 million. On the appropriations directed to the villages of the first phase, the report indicated that the total appropriations amounted to 5.5 billion Egyptian pounds, directed to 1,901 interventions that included 3.3 billion Egyptian pounds in the fiscal year 2019-2020, 2.2 billion Egyptian pounds in 2020-2021 fiscal year. About assessing the impact of the initiative on localizing the sustainable development goals, the report issued by the Ministry of Planning and Economic Development indicated that for the third goal of the sustainable development goals related to good health and well-being, there is an improvement in the rate of health services coverage by about 24 percentage points. Al Said confirmed that 255 medical convoys, 1,400 surgeries, provisions of 538 prosthetic devices, 5,420 eye operations, provision of 16,500 medical glasses, completed the establishment and development of 12 health units, and 56 health units were to be completed by 2020 2021. As for the fourth goal, the report indicated an improvement in the rate of educational services coverage by about 12 percentage points as educational services were provided in three deprived villages. The development of seven nurseries was completed. Furthermore, 45 schools were established or developed, including 717 classrooms were completed. 127 schools include 1,493 semesters during 2020-2021. Regarding the sixth goal, Sanitation coverage improved by about 46 percentage points. This was achieved through the installation of 706 domestic sewage tanks, 1,559 domestic sewage connections and water networks of 7 kilometers long. Also, 1,637 household connections have been installed, 49 grand water wells have been constructed and developed sewage service connected to 21 villages, and the service will be delivered to 55 villages in 2020-2021. On the eighth goal of the Sustainable Development Goals, the report of the Ministry of Planning and Economic Development indicated that small projects worth 438 million Egyptian pounds and 71,000 job opportunities were provided in the governorates of Asyut, Suha, Kuna, Kalyubeya, Minya, Aswan, and Luxor, and Lake New Valley. The report also reviewed the assessment of the impact of Decent Life Initiative on the achievement of the 11th goal of sustainable development in the villages of the initiative. The report indicated that 11,600 houses were improved, 160 kilometers of road were paved, and 11 VET units were established. Nevertheless, the initiative installed 11,000 lighting poles, established and developed 21 youth centers and playgrounds, in addition to establishing and developing nine social units. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, continuing our discussion with Dr. Anand. Now, 
The Decent Life Initiative takes care of the Egyptian countryside, over 4,000 yeah. villages, but this is not where Egypt is stopping. Egypt also has launched the Decent Life for uh, a Climate Resilient mm -hmm. Africa initiative. Uh, and you've also mentioned that there is uh, another initiative, the uh, Africa Drug Agency that was launched about a year, yes. a year and a half ago. Taking our sort of experience mm -hmm. with development and initiatives and the health sector in specific, taking it to the rest of the African continent. How big of a step is that? And it will benefit many African states, but yeah. how does it also return uh, and benefit us uh, directly or indirectly? So there's a big purpose from political and economic perspective and even in terms of neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So an African country, uh, we actually uh, have been leading uh, healthcare initiatives uh, for a long time. Uh, even we've shared the 100 Healthy Lives initiative with the African continent, and there's been around uh, 200k citizens treated from hepatitis C from the African countries. Mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned as well for a Decent Life initiative, it's very important to promote health in the African continent because we are uh, the health gate for the African continent. Mm -hmm. We currently uh, number one manufacturer of drugs in Africa. We have the oldest uh, plants for drug manufacturing. And Africa is actually a very good market in terms of either directly promoting our medications and our mm -hmm. healthcare services and indirectly by promoting health. And promoting health will enhance, in general, the gross domestic product of the continent, will enhance, in general, the infrastructure of health. There is a lot of bonds between the Egyptian uh, governance and the Egyptians and the African uh, countries. And, for example, if we are focusing on one thing, on the making our own decisions. Mm -hmm. In Egypt, we are manufacturing over 90% of our local needs from medications. So we have uh, local uh, manufacturing of more than 90% of our needs. Mm -hmm. In Africa, it's 5%. So we are in the same continent yes. and we can have a spillover. Mm -hmm. We can have a good supply chain with the African countries to make sure that we don't need to make the same crisis of COVID vaccine that mm -hmm. happened with Africa all over again. Yes. Uh, remember, we took the lead of uh, manufacturing the vaccine and um, uh, exporting it to the African countries. Yes. And so we can easily be the gates. We are ensuring good economic reform and bonds, and we are ensuring as well a good political uh, deed and a good political actually side dealing with the other countries. So I guess um, migrating and technology transfer, medical transfer of the technology is very important to be shared. We, do, we, we have the know-how, mm -hmm. we can actually uh, transfer it to the other African countries, and all of us will benefit yes. from having a better health. Mm -hmm. Dr. Anen, um, now one final question because we are running out of time, but you're, you're uh, a specialist in health planning and health economics. Now, a lot of people understand that all these health initiatives and mm -hmm. all the, the attention uh, the government is giving to the health sector here in Egypt really focuses mm. on uh, alleviating the, the mm. quality of life for the Egyptian citizen, but also they don't uh, comprehend the, mm. the economic impact of such uh, care and efforts within the health sector. So can you explain what is, what are the health and the economic benefits from uh, the health care that is uh, being uh, exerted by the government, apart from exporting yeah. vaccines and apart from exporting medicines and pharmaceuticals to different African states. But how, how will this return, taking care of the Egyptian citizens' health, how will this return on the Egyptian economy? So if we are talking about health economics, we are using health economics in many aspects. I will focus on two mm -hmm. very fast. The first of is planning. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if I want to uh, make priorities for uh, my spending in healthcare, how can I actually say that I can allocate this billions of money on hepatitis or on nephrology, kidney transplantation, mm -hmm. or for cancer and oncology? So, in terms of priority setting, um, health economics will provide you the burden of any disease. So, for example, uh, we've done a burden of disease for diabetes in Egypt, and we found out that 
having diabetes in Egypt is actually making a burden of 25 billion Egyptian pounds every year. Mm -hmm. So it's a big burden assessed by the health economics and it needs tackling. If, had, if the disease itself got a little burden or less burden, it was not going to be of focus. I have cancer of high burden, for example. I have uh, diabetes, I have cardiac problems. So in terms of planning the budget, it's very important to have health economics aspects. And it is calculated not only because of what's spent on medications. It's calculated based on the productivity lost. So for example, if someone is not going to his work, I'm losing productivity. Yes. It's what's called <coughs> absentism. He's absent yeah. from his work, I'm losing. And this can be reflected during COVID where we are actually were all of us working from home and the GDP of the world actually decreased and declined. And second thing is to evaluate the return of investment on investment from any initiative I'm doing. So yeah. for example, if I'm doing the 100 healthy lives and treating hepatitis C, I'm getting four pounds for, eight, for every pound I'm spending mm -hmm. because I'm enhancing the longevity of the life, life years saved. I'm enhancing the quality of life. Yes. I'm enhancing the family health. So in return, indirectly, it will impact the gross domestic product and it will enhance the productivity. Yes. I guess our time is yes. actually... Unfortunately, <laughs> yes. But we're running out of yeah, time. But this yeah. has been a very informative because a lot of people don't understand that all the efforts being exerted uh, within the health sector, it's been a, a common popular demand, the health sector, and obviously along with the educational sector. But a lot of people don't realize how important it is not just to raise the quality of life for the Egyptian citizen, but also there is a huge uh, economic return for uh, the economic status and state of Egypt. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this edition of the Daily Debate. Before we go, I'd like to thank my distinguished guest, Dr. Islam Anen, the lecturer of health policy and health economics at uh, <coughs> pardon, Ain Shams University. Dr. Anen, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. My thank pleasure. You, pleasure, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay tuned for more coming up on Al International. I'm Henny Safe. Thank you for joining us.